Uh, hopefully this is better. Uh, if you recall, we talked about the accrual basis of accounting. Um, we, we do things based upon the accrual basis of accounting under generally accepted accounting principles, GAAP, rather than the cash basis of accounting. And so the accrual basis of accounting uh, states that revenues are recognized when products or services or deliver, are delivered and expenses are recognized when incurred. Whereas uh, with cash basis, you recognize revenue when you receive cash and you recognize an expense when you pay it. Very different, very different. And the, the whole idea or argument is that the accrual basis of accounting uh, better reflects a company's financial performance more so than uh, using the cash basis of accounting. And remember, cash basis of accounting is not GAAP, so uh, it is ver verboten by FASB. So, uh, I mean, could you use the cash basis of accounting? Well, yeah, you could. Um, if you're... Uh, not a public company, you're a private company, you could certainly do that. Uh, but let's say you went to a bank and wanted a loan, and the first thing the uh, lending officer is going to ask for are some audited financial statements, and you're, you're going to go, well, you know, we, we're cash basis, and they're going to go, uh, sorry, we can't give you a loan until you get... Uh, audited financial statements and the auditor is going to require you to use uh, the accrual basis of accounting in other words to follow uh, gap in your accounting so for that reason it's probably a good idea even for non-public companies to use the accrual basis of accounting So to, to show you the effects of accrual versus cash basis, let's take a look at a, a, a prepaid expense for insurance of $2,400. We're prepaying for 2400, uh, 24 months of insurance expense beginning December 1 of 2017. Okay, and let's say we're on the calendar year uh, fiscal financial reporting. Okay, so December 31st is our fiscal year end. So, and, and the whole idea here is uh, we're receiving a benefit over more than one accounting period, right? Because uh, we're, the, the insurance for 24 months that we're paying for covers one month in 2017, December 1 through December 31, but it benefits us for future accounting periods as well. And so for that reason, what we're going to do is we're going to take this prepayment, we're going to put it on our books as an asset that's going to be utilized over future periods. And we're going to incur an expense called insurance expense as we receive that benefit. And so that's what you see here. Uh, we prepay it December 1, 2017. We, in, we recognize an expense for December of 2017, one month. In that next year, we, we recognize expenses of $1,200 for the whole year, $100 per month. And then in that last year, 2019, we have a benefit over 11 months, January through November. 
Now compare that with cash basis. With a cash basis um, company, what you would do is recognize the $2,400 expense all in December of 2017. So what's the effect of that? Well, it means that you've overstated expenses in 2017, thereby understating net income. And in 2018 and 2019, since you didn't recognize any expense in those periods, though you received a benefit in those periods, uh, you understated expenses in those periods, 18 and 19. Therefore, you overstated net income. Remember that the revenue recognition principle states that we recognize revenue when the product or service is provided to our customer and at amount that we expect to receive from the customer. Remember, uh, for recognizing expenses, we recognize an expense when it's incurred, at the time it's incurred, And it aims to record expenses in the same accounting period as the revenue that are recognized as a result of those expenses. Sometimes that's easy to do. Uh, sometimes you can identify an expense directly to the revenues that uh, were generated as a result of the efforts that incurred the expense. Sometimes it's not so easy. But the whole idea behind this is you're trying to match up the expense with the revenue that it's the expense is related to. Again, not always easy, but somehow, some way, it has to be done. And note here it says the matching of expenses with revenue benefits is a major part of the adjusting process. One of the things we're going to be doing here real quickly is we're going to be making adjust, adjusting entries. These adjusting entries are made at the uh, end of a reporting period, definitely at the end of the year, but sometimes at the end of a month, end of a quarter, end of a semi-annual semi period. So next we want to prepare and explain these adjusting entries and there's four types uh, prepaid expenses and unearned revenues those are called deferrals and then you have something called accruals A-C-C-R-U-A-L-S those two are accrued expenses and accrued revenues. Um, these four types of adjustments are made using a three-step process. First, you want to determine what the current account balance equals. Well, you should be able to do that really easy from your ledger accounts. Um, step two, you want to determine what the current balance should be or sh should equal. And then you want to record an adjusting entry to get step one to step two. So let's see how that works. All right. Prepaid or sometimes called deferred expenses. are assets paid for in advance of receiving their benefits. Well, we just saw a prepaid expense in our previous example of prepaid insurance. We, we paid for it in advance of receiving the benefits from that prepaid insurance policy. 
other types of uh, prepaid expense are prepaid rent. We prepay the rent ahead of receiving the benefit. Uh, supplies is also a prepaid expense. We we pay for expo uh, supplies um, ahead of time and then we use them in the future. When you make your um, adjusting entry for these prepaid expenses, you're going to reduce the asset account and you're going to increase the appropriate expense account. So here's, here's our example of insurance paid to cover 24 months beginning December 1 of 2017 and for the month of and the year of 2017, month of December of 2017, we start with our payment. We list it as an asset called prepaid insurance. So that's our debit and our credit is to cash. Now at the end of the year, December 31, 2017, what does the amount of prepaid insurance, what's the balance need to be? Well, it needs to be 2300 And so we need to make an adjustment to prepaid insurance of the difference between 2400 and 2300 So we're going to uh, credit prepaid insurance for $100 and debit insurance expense for $100. Now normally you would do it just the other way around in the, your journal entry, right? You would debit insurance expense. You always start with the debit and you credit prepaid insurance, but um, that's a that's a given hopefully at this point in in your learning cycle but just you know sometimes I start with the credit I'll try not to but sometimes I do but just understand when you make your entry you always start with the debit side so you made your adjustment for the year and you now have a balance of 2300 in prepaid insurance and your insurance expense for the year is $100. So what it, what happens if you don't do this? Well, the asset is overstated for the year. Uh, your expense uh, accounts, total expense is understated. Therefore, you have um, overstated income since you understated expenses. And there's your entry. <laughs> All right, let's talk about supplies. That's a prepaid expense. Here we have an example of this company uh, prepaying or paying for supplies. Some were used, they were bought in December and some were used in December. They come up to the end of the month and they, they do a physical count of the unused supplies. They had purchased 9,720 of supplies in December. And of that amount, there's only 8,670 remaining. And so the assumption is that they used those supplies 
that are not there and so they've used the difference which is one thousand fifty dollars worth of supplies and so the supplies account is currently at nine thousand seven twenty it needs to be eight thousand six seventy so they need to make a uh, an entry a, a credit to supplies of one thousand fifty dollars and the debit corresponding debits going to be one thousand fifty dollars to supplies expense and that's going to get them down uh, their supply account balance down to eight thousand six seventy and again this if you don't do this you're going to have a an asset overstated at the end of the year you're going to have expense understated at the end of the year Now, depreciation is a special type of prepaid expense. When you buy plant assets, property, plant, and equipment that you use in your business, you're, you're using it in the business to generate revenue. You're manufacturing products with this stuff you're doing whatever you do to generate income which is the primary purpose of business and because these assets are used over they're they're considered long-lived assets they're used over more than one accounting period sometimes many accounting periods what you have to do is you have to expense the cost of these assets over more than one accounting period and so what you're going to do is when you purchase these plant assets you're going to put it um, in the accounting records as an asset and over the lifetime of that asset you're going to expense the cost of it and so we we allocate these the cost of these plant assets over its expected useful life now we do this using different methods but uh, the main thing is we do this using what's called depreciation expense okay there's several types of depreciation methods that we'll talk about in later chapters but right now I just want to get you familiar with the process and so one of the methods we can use is called straight line depreciation which is uh, the formula is the numerator is the assets cost minus the estimated salvage value at the end of its useful life something that has to be estimated the denominator is the assets useful life and what you're going to come up with after you've done that calculation is you're going to come up with a an expense that's exactly the same amount each month of the assets useful life so again useful life is the period of time that an assets expected to help produce revenues for the company um, useful life expires as a result of wear and tear or because it no longer satisfies the needs of the business it can become uh, unuseful to the business because new technologies and things like that salvage value is whatever the company thinks they're going to get from this at the end of its useful life 
sometimes that amount is zero, but you know, scrap value many times is almost nothing. And sometimes companies figure out, well, the salvage value is going to be zero because of things like obsolescence and, you know, it's just, just going to be worn down or whatever, just not marketable. All right, so here we have an example of this company purchasing equipment on December 1. And notice, all these adjustments are made at the end of the year. Now, I know this is kind of hokey, but this happens. You buy stuff during the year. Here, it just happens to be the last month of the year, the beginning of the last month of the year, but it, it's a great example. Um, they purchase equipment on December 1 for $26,000. It has an estimated useful life of 60 months, so five years. Uh, the equipment's expected to be worth about 8000 at the end of those five years, and they purchase the equipment on December 1, but now it's the end of the year, December 31st. So they've utilized this piece of equipment for one month out of... Uh, the 60 months, so it's got a remaining estimated useful life of 59 months at the end of December. And so what they're going to do is they're going to calculate the monthly depreciation expense. So they're going to take the 26000 minus the expected salvage value, so that's 18000 and divide it into 60 months to come up with $300 per month. And so at the end of December, you're going to um, debit depreciation expense. Now notice the credit doesn't go directly to debiting the equipment account. It's going to go to a separate account called accumulated depreciation. In this, and in this case, it's going to say should say accumulated depreciation uh, hyphen equipment to identify what it's for. You know, in case they have several pieces of uh, equipment or several plant assets that they have to have these accumulated depreciation accounts, you want to be able to identify which asset account it corresponds to. So when you have depreciation expense, notice you've got to create this accumulated depreciation account. It's considered what's called a contra asset account because it, it um, decreases its corresponding asset account. And when, when they have to report this in the financial statements, this equipment will be listed with their assets, but it will be listed as equipment less its accumulated depreciation. The difference between the two is called the assets book value. But anyway, bottom line is at the end of the year we make this adjusting entry for depreciation expense uh, by debiting depreciation expense for $300 and crediting accum accumulated depreciation equipment for $300. And note we have our, we have our date we have our accounts, we have our amounts, and we have an, an explanation as a proper form for making our adjusting entry or, or any type of journal entry. Now, since we're depreciating $300 per month, this is what um, the asset account, this particular asset account, will look like at the end of uh, February, three months uh, after we bought it. 
there would be $900 of accumulated depreciation for those three months and the book value, the difference between the cost of the equipment less its accumulated depreciation is 25100 Okay, so I'll let you look at the need to know things again. Uh, check these out in the um, ebook, especially. Um, the ebook has some um, additional ways of, of looking at this stuff. You can also get uh, uh, what well, sounds like a robot, but uh, you can get uh, narrated. Um, discussions in there as well. Uh, again, it sounds like a robot, but if you like that sort of thing, go ahead. Whoop. Okay. The next category we want to talk about is unearned or deferred revenues. So now we start our discussion of deferrals. Uh, one type of deferral is unearned revenues. And so unearned revenues are, are re uh, when we receive cash ahead of providing a good or service. And so when we do that, we have to uh, list a liability originally and of course the cash is going into our cash account as a debit so we debit cash for the amount of the prepayment that we received and we credit uh, this liability account called unearned revenue and as we earn the revenue we're going to decrease that liability and we're going to increase our revenues. So here we have an example. We get paid in advance for a $60 uh, consulting fee covering the period from 1227 through 224 of the next year. So there's that. It's for $3,000. So we're earning this $3,000 over the 60-day period that begins 1227. At the end of 12, at the end of the year 1231, we have earned five days worth of the total 60 days of consulting fees. So we take and we multi well we divide five into sixty and then multiply that figure by three thousand to come up with two hundred and fifty dollars worth of um, revenues that we have to recognize at the end of the year. And so we're going to debit unearned consulting revenue for two hundred and fifty dollars, and we're going to credit consulting revenue. If we don't do that, our liabilities, uh, liability accounts are going to be uh, overstated and our revenues are going to be understated. Therefore, our uh, net income is going to be understated. Accrued expenses. These are costs incurred in a period that are both unpaid and unrecorded. And so we need 
to figure out what those uh, liabilities we have at the end of the accounting period are and account for them. And we're going to debit an expense account and we're going to credit a liability account. So here we have an example of salary expense. This company pays its employees $70 a day or $350 for a five-day work week. Salaries are paid every two weeks on a Friday. In this case, uh, 1231 is a Wednesday. So that uh, three-day salaries are owed at the end of the year, $70 times three. So a total of $210 is still owed at the end, end of the year. And so what they're going to have to do is they're going to have to increase salaries expense by $210. And they're going to, and so that's going to be your debit. And you're going to have to credit this thing called salaries payable because it's going to be paid in that next year. And again, if you don't do this, you're going to uh, have your liabilities section understated. You're going to have your expense accounts understated. Therefore, net income will be overstated for the year. Now that next year as an example, just continuing the example, when you pay this, you're going to pay it with other amounts owed during that next year. And so you're going to debit the salaries payable for the three days that you accrued an expense, salaries payable, and just simply uh, the debit, well, you're going to have a salaries expense for the other seven days accrued during that new year. And of course, your debit, or excuse me, your credit would be to cash. Last but not least, accrued revenues. At the end of the year, you're supposed to, any revenues that you've earned at the end of the year, you need to recognize those, re that, those revenues. And so these are uh, revenues earned in a period that are unrecorded and not yet received in cash or other assets. So you're going to need to debit an asset called accounts receivable, and you're going to have to credit a revenue account. So here we have an example. Fast forwards, customer agreed to pay $2,700 on January 10 of the next year for future services over the next 30 days. Um, as of 1231 in year end, 20 days worth of services have been provided and earned, which totals $1,800. And so they need to make an adjusting entry to increase two accounts, debit accounts receivable for $1,800 and, uh, credit consulting revenue for $1,800. And by doing so, you increase an asset account and you increase a revenue account. And 
if you don't do this, you will have assets understated and revenues understated, and thus net income will be understated. And of course, when you actually receive payment, you're going to uh, debit the cash that's paid. And, of course, you know, the other, in this example, the other 10 days of consulting revenue in the, ne in the new year uh, is going to be considered consulting revenue because you haven't recognized it yet. All right. Okay, so... After you've made all these adjusting entries, what you want to do is you want to prepare what's called an adjusted trial balance. Notice in Chapter 2 what you prepared at the end of that chapter was called <clears throat> excuse me, an unadjusted trial balance. Um, and even though they did prepare some financial statements from those unadjusted trial balances, those are considered... Uh, unadjusted financial statements because you haven't prepared your adjustments uh, yet okay and so um, th if you make your financial statements from unadjusted trial balances those would not reflect all your expenses all your revenues all your assets all your liabilities um, it's not really it's not really reflective of what the com company's performance should be uh, under the accrual method of accounting. So it's not not really gap. So for that reason, you you really don't prepare financial statements until you've a until after you've made your adjusting entries and prepared an adjusted trial balance and then you pre you prepare your financial statements by taking the balances of the accounts that are listed in your adjusted trial balance so let's look at that so here <clears throat> you've got a worksheet and this worksheet shows the unadjusted trial balance and the adjustments that were made and notice that each adjustment has in parenthesis a uh, letter by this that corresponds to the ad adjustments made in your in your journal And based upon those adjustments, you have your adjusted balances listed in the adjusted trial balances. And you, you can thus take those balances in the adjusted trial balance columns. Notice that the debit and credit amounts are exactly the same after adjustments. In this example, the debit balances of all accounts equal a total of 47610 All the credit balance accounts equal 47610 So our after all the adjustments, our debit balances and credit balances are still equal to each other. In other words, they're still in balance. Just like we have talked about, they have to be with, with the um, accounting equation. And once you've made those adjustments and prepared your uh, uh, adjusted trial balance worksheet, you can take from that worksheet the balances in the adjusted trial balance and prepare your financial statements and so you want to prepare the financial statements in the following order you want to prepare your income statement 
using revenues and expense accounts from the trial balance. And <clears throat> what you'll notice here is you start preparing income statements using the numbers near the bottom of your adjusted trial balance because revenues and expenses are near the bottom or at the bottom of your adjusted trial balance as are well the statement of retained earnings takes information from the uh, income statement as well as some of the information kind of towards the middle of your adjusted trial balance. Your balance sheet, even though it's the third item, um, you, what you're doing there is taking accounts that are near the top of the adjusted trial balance. Um, it's really kind of hard to see this, I know, but um, notice this is exactly what I was telling you. Consulting revenues and uh, expenses are near the bottom of the adjusted trial balance. Um, and in step three, the balance sheet, you're taking information from the top of the adjusted trial balance. And notice the reason why uh, the income statements prepared in step one is because you need the net income amount for your statement of retained earnings, the, the thing you're doing in step two. You can't prepare step two until you have net income. And you can't prepare step three, the balance sheet, until you have retained earnings, which is what you're doing in step two. So there, there's a method to this madness of, as to why you prepare these this way, in this order. All right, let's stop there and I'll pick it up at des uh, describe and preparing closing entries.